Good afternoon. It's uh, really a pleasure to be able to visit uh, Ashoka University and to meet with all of you uh, this afternoon. So um, what I'm, I'm not going to be speaking about my organization, um, but more about a concept that I'd like to share with you, and a, and a particular void, and a particular kind of poverty, which is energy poverty. Uh, estimates vary, but it's believed that almost 400 million people in India today don't have access to reliable electricity. That's one third of our population. And while we've made remarkable progress in actually bringing electrical power to our people over the, over the last many decades, it's still unacceptable that in India today, one third, one out of every three people, cannot rely on having access to electricity. Energy poverty, the absence of access to electricity, is a particularly pernicious form of poverty. It impacts health, it impacts education, livelihoods, and I think has a disproportionate impact on women. And things that we in urban areas take for granted, such as the ability to flick on a light switch, um, charge a cell phone, put on a fan, uh, watch, watch television, or, or, or use a refrigerator, these are all concepts that for millions or hundreds of millions of our fellow Indians are not attainable. Uh, as an example, um, you know, I am also a creature of, of urban India, but my yoga teacher is a young man from Bihar who, who helps keep me in touch with the other part of life in our country. And he tells me whenever he goes home uh, to a village that is supposedly electrified, um, he has to basically in the evenings at home dip a wick in kerosene, stick it in a bottle, and the family sits around that. So that, that unfortunately is the reality of too many uh, people in our country. The government is, is aware of this and uh, it has been acting upon this. And as I said, there has been steady progress in bringing electricity to more and more people. But uh, there's just too many people who are still left out of that net. And the question is, you know, when will they get what they, they need and they, and they deserve? It's important uh, when dealing with government announcements to also be clear on what definitions are. The government has had many schemes on, on electrifying rural India. And if you believe uh, or if you listen to their statements, they, they claim that 90% of India is now electrified. Well, the question is, what is their definition of electrification? Uh, it often it just is that there's a wire leading to a village, and that's when they declare victory. Uh, there is no mention made of, is there any electricity running through those wires? How many hours in the day? Uh, does that electricity course? Uh, what is the stability of the voltage levels? What's the predictability of the hours when that electricity that, that is available comes? And most importantly, there's no mention made of how many households or individuals are actually connected to the electricity, the people who reside in the village, inside the village. So if one goes in that level of detail, one can understand why we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. So we need to discuss how best we can get affordable and reliable electricity that to, to the millions that do without. The government's action plan clearly is based on getting the grid to these people who are not yet covered. And actually, just a few days ago, the Prime Minister announced that within the next 1,000 days, we will have 100% coverage. But there are many challenges with that plan. The grid will need more power plants to feed into that grid. Those power plants invariably will be fired with coal. And as we all know, the mining of coal, the burning of coal is environmentally damaging. And we're already having to import larger and larger amounts of coal to meet our needs. And apart from being dirty, coal burning is also inefficient. On an average, our better plants use three units of coal to produce one unit of electricity. And our more inefficient and older ones actually take four units of coal to uh, produce one unit of electricity. And the grids themselves are very expensive to build, especially to remoter reaches and to those areas that are far away from where the electricity is actually being generated. There's a long lead time in building a plant or in extending a grid. And grids themselves uh, have inefficiencies. Uh, we have average technical losses of up to 30% of the electricity that is put into the grid, by the time it reaches the end user, 30% of it is, is lost. 
and grids themselves have environmental impacts as they traverse forests and other ecologically sensitive areas. So for all these reasons, uh, this grand plan of continuing to build power plants and build grids and get electricity to our, our people may not work and may not have the desired benefits. It is estimated that grid power costs our state electricity boards about 10 rupees a unit to buy. And uh, average realizations, we're told, are 5 rupees. So they effectively lose 5 rupees for every unit of electricity that they sell. And these electricity boards uh, that are already bankrupt uh, find it far easier not to buy electricity and not to supply uh, it to individuals and villages and households, even if there is supply or there is a grid. So what are the alternatives that are less expensive, more immediate, and less ecologically harmful? The market and the demand certainly exist. As I mentioned, there's 400 million people literally dying for, for a product. Uh, it's huge unmet demand. People either go without or they go to uh, other inefficient and polluting and expensive solutions like kerosene, like diesel, like firewood, and like biomass. And the cost of this is extremely high, both in nominal terms, and much higher if you factor in health and environmental costs. And the tragedy is that the poorest of our country pay the most for the electricity that they need. So we need effective alternatives that meet these needs. And we believe the answer lies in solar power, especially distributed solar power. This activity in this space has been going on for, for many years. And we have a range of solutions that are available in rural India, from solar power appliances, particularly lanterns, to rooftop so, uh, solar installations that can, at a minimum, uh, generate enough electricity to provide light for two bulbs and maybe a, a, a cell charging point, to more uh, extensive solutions like mini grids, where entire communities of households and enterprises can get the electricity they need from solar power. So these localized, reliable, scalable solutions meet both equity and aspirational needs of, of our populace. And when they are introduced, they unleash a virtuous circle of social and economic activity that positively feeds upon itself, generating both more demand and more benefits to the communities in question, and positively impacting the communities, the households, and the enterprises there. So this is known, and the question is why haven't these systems blanketed the country and solved the problem I'm, I'm talking about today? So obviously, situations, each of these situations, they face their own challenges. And I'll briefly go through some of those to see how best they can be addressed. First is uh, technology. This is not, these aren't high technology solutions. Solar PV technology is, is quite tested, it's quite proven, and it's quite prevalent. And the cost of this technology has been dropping steadily as, a, as the price of solar panels has, has dropped. And actually, on the, on the usage, on the demand side, technology has made uh, a significant impact on energy efficiency. So for example, LEDs have had a dramatic impact on the, uh, on the uh, access to lighting in, in, in rural areas, because the amount of load necessary to, to light um, a couple of bulbs has dropped dramatically. But we still need to do a lot more work in the space of efficiency as we go up the energy consumption ladder and go beyond the basics of having two light bulbs. So we need more efficient fans. <coughs> we need more efficient uh, refrigerators, televisions, and uh, agricultural pump sets. But the one area in technology that still needs a, a major breakthrough, and if it happens, will make a, a, a dramatic change, is that in storage. Uh, renewable power, given its nature, uh, its intermittency, uh, has to be augmented with storage capacity. And uh, the day uh, the world can deliver a more efficient and a more available storage solution, um, we believe that uh, the, the range of these solutions will increase markedly. Finance, as always, is, is a significant issue. It's a major challenge. And solar solutions have a particular uh, characteristic associated with them in that most of the ex uh, expenditure is front-end in the installation, while the actual running costs are very low. So we need capital to install uh, a, a solar-based system. And this has to either be borne by the supplier or by the consumer or by a financial intermediary who can, who can bridge the gap between the supplier and the consumer. 
and we uh, need different and unusual uh, or innovative playing, uh, payment models, and those are emerging like prepaid power or pay-as-you-go. But in addition to the flow of capital, equally important are the issues around the understanding and assessment of risk associated uh, with, with such investments. And we, we desperately also need risk mitigating mechanisms like first loss coverage and, and like uh, insurance, uh, which are still fairly immature in, in the country and a lot more work needs to be done over there. Capacity is again a, a key need and capacity is needed at all levels. We need a cohort of ITI level trained technicians who can service and install uh, such systems. And one of the key characteristics of, of, of such a solution is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't lend itself to a top-down structure. Uh, you cannot have uh, a large government body or a large corporate entity uh, <coughs> aiming to electrify you know, 1,000 villages or 2,000 villages at a time. By definition, this solution has to be ground, ground up, and we need village-level enterprises to establish these, to take ownership, and, and, and to, to act both as owner and customer. Um, so for this, we need uh, to, uh, a group of village-level entrepreneurs. They could be self-help groups. We have examples of women self-help groups successfully running many grids. But we really need a group of people who can understand a business plan, who can communicate a business plan, who can deal with a banker, and, and obtain the finance, the financing they need. And if there is one capacity that we're in short supply is a group of such entrepreneurs who can communicate uh, their, their ambitions and deal with the financial community. And there's a significant amount of, if I may say, illiteracy in the financial community as well. Uh, most of our bankers do not understand the risks involved uh, in a project like this. Uh, and because they don't understand it, uh, they are just don't deal with it because they think it's something that's not uh, not something they can, uh, they can handle. But we, need, again, need a lot of training with, for our bankers and our lenders to understand how th the risk works and how you can structure transactions such that you have an acceptable level of risk and an acceptable level of risk. And finally, we have policy. That's an area in which my organization works in, in particular. Uh, because uh, for investment to take place, you need certain predictability around policy. What investors uh, and businessmen don't like is risk that they cannot predict. Electricity is uh, a state regulated subject and every state in the country has state electricity regulatory boards that actually administer the price of electricity. And the principle they work on is that all, all consumers within a particular category can access electricity at the same price. So if you're buying electricity from the, the grid, uh, you know what price you can get at. However, the econo economics of, of mini grids are, are very different. They, they lack the economies of scale, and they have to perforce work on a fully loaded cost model and cannot ignore certain other costs that maybe a large grid operator can. So the risk uh, is that what happens to our investment the day the regulator says, um, you know, you have to uh, compete with the grid and offer them the same price. That will obviously mean the death knell of this industry. So we're, what we're seeking to do is work with regulators especially in, uh, in a few key states where this is a major problem, uh, to develop a regulatory uh, and, uh, policy framework where the state will intermediate and, uh, and try to address the gap between the, the price at which the electricity is being produced and the price at which electricity needs to be uh, bought by the consumers such that it protects both individuals and enables uh, this business to go forward. Uh, a related policy risk that we're seeking to address is what happens to your investment the day the grid arrives. There you have gone ahead and established this grid, got the customers, got the technology, and uh, you know, are running a good business. And uh, you know, one day the state electricity board decides to wire up your villages and basically take away your business. Here again, I think is a fundamental difference in how we should be looking at this, uh, this, this business of, of many grids. Uh, too often it's looked at as, as a, as a band-aid, as a bridge, as, as, as a temporary solution. But in a resource-poor country, uh, in a country which is energy-poor as well, I think we need to uh, use all the resources that we have and uh, use uh, the mini-grid system as uh, a complement uh, to the overall grid planning and not as, uh, as a substitute. 
So there, too, uh, work is going on with the regulators such that many grid operators, if the grid arrives, can work as franchisees to the main grid and act as a component. So we believe by systematically uh, addressing these challenges, we see a future, an alternate future, uh, to one that uh, is waiting for the grid to reach every village for more uh, thermal power plants to be built um, at, at a significant financial and ecological cost. And that will address the needs of, uh, of rural India in a way that's reliable, affordable, and, and clean. And, and we uh, look forward to continuing that work and hopefully coming back and reporting that uh, you know, this problem, if not completely eliminated, has been significantly addressed. Thank you. Thank you.